everybody loves a good mason jar. You've got pop country songs written about them. You've got all kinds of um, decorators and home interior decor type people who love mason jars. Uh, there is, however, a small misconception that old mason jars are extremely valuable. Sometimes true, most times not. Uh, a lot of people bring in boxes and boxes of boxes of mason jars uh, into the shop, and and you know they're thinking thirty five, forty dollars a piece. Sadly, for the most part, they're five to seven dollars a piece. However, as with anything, there are some rarities. So that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today: are the mason jars. There are lots of different kinds. There's lots to talk about about the mason jars. There are myths and legends and those sorts of things that uh, accompany some of the sales of mason jars, but. Uh, for the most part, what you're looking at is an, um, a necessity of the early 20th century, late 19th century, early 20th century, of preserving food. Uh, there was a time, not so many years ago, that if you didn't preserve it in the summer and fall, then you didn't eat it in the winter. And uh, that's the way that it was produced, is, uh, was, was through a canning process, a sealing process, uh, in mason jars. Now, why do they call them mason jars? Well, there was a fellow by the last name of Mason who developed this process to make these jars, uh, and he had the patent on them until 1858. Now, you will see a lot of jars like this particular jar right here. It says, patent November 30th, 1858. That patent number um, is um, the, the patent. I suppose it's the beginning of the patent. I earlier said the end of the patent, but it's, it's the beginning of the patent. Uh, of when these jars were made, um, and it kind of took his, um, you know, kind of took his name. This is one of the OG jars right here, the Mason's Jar, and um, there are uh, different brands, as we will discuss a little further on, like a uh, Ball Mason Jar you might be familiar with. Um, another brand is Atlas. Um, Atlas actually made a brand or a specific uh, a jar called the Atlas Lucky Jar, and it had a four-leaf clover on it. They're fairly, uh, fairly popular. But um, mason jars were used to store food, beans, canned goods, and those sorts of things. And um, there were a few different styles. There were different ages, and and these are certain things that will um, they will affect the price of a specific jar. Uh, this is kind of what you see most of the time. Is just this you know, later version of the blue ball mason jar. Let's talk a little bit about those colors. Why are they blue? Uh, well, when they were um, blowing this glass or molding this glass, if you will, there were certain elements that were placed in the glass to give it that blue color, which offered clarity. There are some clear jars, uh, but blue jars were more popular. Uh, as a matter of fact, there was also some clear jars that were blown or molded uh, with manganese to make them clear. Uh, and if manganese was um, put in there a little heavy, it would react with ultraviolet light later on, and those jars would turn purple. So if you ever see a light purple haze on a white jar, then it came from uh, it being either the first of the batch or maybe the last of the batch that made the mason jar purple. And it's a reaction to light. Uh, be careful, though, because a lot of those have been uh, reproduced and aren't the real deal, but there are several out there, and they will command good money. There are also some amber jars um, that were used for specific medicinal purposes. They will uh, command a good uh, good value. Um, there are different shapes of jars, like this particular jar here uh, is what's called a shoulder jar, or some people will call it a sheep's nose jar, um, because if you'll notice, as opposed to this jar... Uh, it doesn't have this little bulge right here. It kind of goes straight up to where the lid would be. Um, here's another example of this. This is a uh, uh, the ball jar. Uh, again, this is a Mason's brand jar. It's got kind of that particular style lid on it. Um, the numbering system. Almost all of your Mason jars will have a number on the bottom of them. They were actually just batch numbers uh, so that the manufacturer could keep up with the batches that were made. But there is a marketing ploy or a, um, I guess, a, I don't want to say a fad, but there's something to be said about the number 13 jars. Everybody talks about the number 13 and how much more valuable they are. And they actually are more valuable because 
I sell them for more money than a number 11 or a number 5 or something along those lines. With these number 13 jars come a story. I won't call it a myth. I won't call it a legend. I won't call it a fable. I'll just say here's the story that I heard. So we live in southern Appalachia where moonshining at its time was a big deal. And uh, moonshiners would use mason jars to transport their liquor. And the old story goes that every time a moonshiner would come across the number 13 on the bottom of a jar, that he would crack it or crash it or trash it or whatever, bust it, um, so that it can be used because number 13 was um, unlucky. And if they were to haul liquor in number 13 jars, then uh, maybe they would get caught uh, by the police or something along those lines. But So that's the legend that goes with these particular jars, that um, the number 13 was unlucky and that it was busted. Um, it does fetch a premium. Uh, for example, these um, three right here are number 13 jars. Um, half gallon, quart, pint. Any pint jar is going to hold a premium, especially a pint number 13. Now, the vendor has these, if I'm not mistaken, this three, uh, three set right here at $280. You know, this pint number 13 would easily fetch 150 on its own. Uh, they're just pretty rare uh, because of that number 13. Now, this is a half pint jar. It is not a half pint number 13. I've never seen a half pint number 13, but legend on the street says that there are some out there. And if you by chance happen to have one at your house, please give me a call. I would pay dearly for one of those. Um, word on the street is that one sold at one time for $1,500. Since I've never seen one or never saw that one, that's almost hard to believe. But, you know, it is the way that it is. Uh, so, concerning lids, there are a couple different types. Um, most popular are the zinc lids. Uh, you see most of these. These were, um, uh, they had zinc in the bar. They, had, they were made from zinc. Actually, as a matter of fact, uh, Ball Zinc Corporation in Greenville, Tennessee made a lot of these before they changed to a different style. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Now also, here's something a little special. Some of these were numbered on the inside. And this one has number 13 on it. So there's some added value to a number 13 lid because people want to put a number 13 lid with a number 13 jar. So the way that this would work is that uh, little milk glass there was uh, shoved down on what was called a rubber that would go around uh, there and it would uh, be tightened up and then sealed thermally and it would preserve the food that was on the inside. Another style was this style which is called a bale style. Now uh, this is a pretty nice piece and you just kind of situate that around there to where you can get the lid off um, and it would also have a, uh, a rubber seal underneath it and then you would simply just flip that down. That's uh, This is called a bale and it would secure whatever it is that you needed um, secured. There were also now these type see-through lids that had uh, a glass fixture on it uh, and they would have been pressed down upon the rubber seal and sealed that way. I think that's pretty much everything that there is to know about collectible ball mason jars. A lot of people collect the numbers, a lot of people collect um, different styles, different brands. There's a lot of things that can be collected. They present well. They just represent an old era. Uh, people buy them to put buttons or marbles or matchbooks or display anything like that they they have a good vintage look there are a couple of resources that i'd like to share with you this is what's called the red book and everything you need to know about a mason jar will be in this book um, it um it has pictures in it um, sometimes they're crudely drawn um, but you can find out dates price guides things like that from this particular book uh, anything you need to know, if you come to my shop with a rare mason jar and you say, hey, what's this worth? I'm going to drag out this book. One final point that I would like to know is, uh, or that I'd like to share, is this little cheat sheet of dating ball mason jars. Uh, there are different logos for different um, times in which they were made. Uh, you can see how each of these are different and how each of these uh, represent different times. Uh, this particular one right here, which is, uh, what, 1896 to 1910, is called the third L. If you'll notice, when the script of the L uh, goes through the two L's there, and it, there's another loop, and it's kind of a uh, what they call the third L. The one following that one, this one right here, is called the dropped A. It's 1910 to 1923, I think. And because if you'll notice, the, the A there, and those are 
uh, and then all caps. They call that one the all caps. But um, those are how you date uh, ball jars. Maybe some other time I'll do a video specifically on reproductions because there are uh, several reproductions out there that can trip you up if you uh, want to buy a legitimate old-time ball mason jar. So, you know, if you want to collect them for their collectability or invest in them for their investment price or if you just want to decorate with them, you can never go wrong with a mason jar. They represent times gone by. Thankfully, I just happen to be in the business of time school gone by, so if you need any mason jars, come see me and I'll hook you up here at the Backcourts Antiques. We'll catch you later.